When Harold Wilson became Prime Minister in October 1964, he was a comparatively young man, 48. His background was from moderate, moderate back, uh, origins in West Yorkshire. He'd gone to grammar school, he'd thrived, went to Oxford, uh, took a good degree in politics, philosophy and economics, became an economics lecturer at Oxford, and then during the war served as a expert civil servant, having volunteered for war service, working alongside William Beveridge. He had in the 1930s been uh, active in liberal politics when he was at Oxford, but by 1945 he'd moved very much to the left and in the election of that year he was uh, among the youngest of the new intake of Labour MPs and within a few years a very young member of the cabinet as president of the Board of Trade. He thus attained the premiership as someone who was reasonably well qualified for the role, having worked in government as a civil servant, having had this intellectual training and having already held a significant cabinet office. When he succeeded Hugh Gateskill as leader of the party in early 1963, however, he inherited a party which had become internally divided in the period since the 1959 election. Divided over, in particular, two issues. Firstly, the nuclear bomb, and secondly, the question of nationalisation and whether the commitment to this enshrined in clause four of the party constitution should be modernised or not. Gateskill had on both of these issues been aligned with the more moderate and perhaps modernising elements. Wilson, as a Bevanite in the early 1950s, had not. In contrast to the um, fairly nuanced position that Gateskill took on the bomb. Wilson's reaction to Macmillan's negotiation of the Polaris deal in December 1962 was pithily. It isn't independent, it isn't British, and it won't deter. He took a similarly pragmatic view of the um, calls for modernising clause 4, pointing out that people didn't act out of the Bible. Instead, in language which Macmillan described as papering over the cracks, Wilson sought to come up with a new narrative that his party could unite around, that of technological revolution, perhaps appropriately being a technocrat himself. Indeed, the times were ripe for such a uh, program. The period of the 1960s was dominated by images of modernity, nuclear power stations, Concorde, computing, were all new exciting technologies that Wilson's language sought to capitalise upon. So when he came to power, he appeared to be promising both to modernise his country, 
and his party. Wilson was adept at using props, important in an era in which television was coming to dominate political communications. He was certainly more adept at it than his Tory rival, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, who had succeeded Macmillan as Prime Minister in October 1963. Hume suffering from looking like he had a head like a skull, apparently, on television, and also coming across as being unconvincing on economics, not surprisingly for a man who'd spent almost the entirety of his political career concentrating on foreign policy. Instead, the technocratic Wilson could promise to deliver on the modernisation of Britain that Macmillan somewhat falteringly had tried to launch in late 1962. At the Labour Party conference in 1963, he promised the white heat of a scientific revolution, the development of a dynamic, classless society. He promised to reforge links with the Commonwealth and he explored a series of major technocratic changes to the machinery of government in the run-up to the 1964 election, not least innovations such as the creation, such as the creation of the Ministry of Technology. In part, this drive was created by the competitive situation Britain found itself in in the early 1960s, with relatively slow economic growth compared to the Wirtschaftswunde of West Germany, or indeed the apparent success of the Ministry du Plan of um, de Gaulle's France. This led to a British enthusiasm to try and find a mechanism to plan for more successful economic growth than had hitherto been the case. A process which had already begun under Macmillan when in the National Economic Development Corporation uh, Council, which uh, Wilson uh, inherited, they'd already been talking about trying to achieve a 4% annual rate, growth rate in Britain, something that eluded both heralds. Trying to grow the economy faster had a tendency to suck in imports. Indeed, the incoming Labour government inherited a trade deficit of, uh, of 800 million from its conservative predecessors, something which put considerable pressure upon sterling. There was some consideration whether the government should have um, devalued the currency at this point in time. Uh, a government with a very small majority of three and all um, did not feel able to do so. Um, this is not least because, as uh, Jim Callahan later commented to me, uh, that they felt obligated to those Commonwealth holders of sterling around the world. They were no more successful at shedding the Macmillan government's commitment to the Anglo-French Concord, uh, a technological triumph, but a financial disaster, though they did manage to cancel the TSR2, um, an attempt to create an all singing, all dancing um, aircraft for the RAF, which proved prohibitively expensive. And the Labour government dropped that and bought American instead. They did, however, despite the pre-election rhetoric, remain committed to some 
high tech, highly expensive prestige projects, not least the development of nuclear warheads, which took place under the Ministry of Technology, the minister of, of which was uh, initially, ironically, a nuclear disarmer called Frank Cousins, the leader of the Transport and General Workers Union. The other new ministry was the Department of Economic Affairs created to establish an alternative positive driver of economic change alongside what was often seen as the dead hand of the Treasury, as opposed to the Treasury's focus upon budgetary policies, the uh, DEA was seen as trying to drive investment and uh, allocation of resources so as to grow the economy positively. One of the instruments of the DEA and this industrial strategy was the Industrial Reorganisation Commission, which sought to pick national champions, merge firms together and create thereby more efficient, more internationally competitive organisations. This was not entirely a innovation of the Wilson government, the Macmillan years had, for instance, seen the creation of the British Aircraft Corporation in 1960. The Wilson years, however, took this somewhat further, um, trying to create large engineering uh, corporations, uh, the computer uh, such as GEC, the computing company ICL, um, and the uh, motoring conglomerate British Leyland. None of these proved particularly successful. Stitching together a number of medium-sized, not terrifically well-run companies into large giant national champions didn't necessarily make those national champions any more efficient. Indeed, in many ways, the new, uh, the new merged companies were not really merged except as financial elements uh, at all. The ambitions of the national plan launched in 1965 proved no easier to deliver. The perennial problems of overambition, setting too high targets, and the tendency of the British economy to suck in imports and thereby inflation tended to knock all of this uh, awry, as we will see when we come on to the Ju July days of 1966. How then could the government produce sustainable economic growth without running to the, into this problem of inflation. The alternative was to reach for the device which had been used every so often by the Atlee government and the Macmillan government before them, which is the control of prices and income. Prices and incomes policy, however, did not prove any easier than it had been for Wilson's predecessors. One of the members of the Prices and Incomes Board, the academic Hugh Clegg, uh, in his later book, How to Run an Incomes Policy and Why We've Made Such a Mess of the Last One, states, existing pay distribution is unfair. The chief cause of the pay explosion and a major cause of many other industrial relations problems is the growing realisation of the injustice of our existing income distribution. All incomes policy which sustains existing relativities for long will be seen as unjust. The policy must therefore differentiate. Indeed, what he's spelling out there is that the very existence of government intervention in the wages market leads to increasing awareness of the unfairness of relative pay levels.
It also lead, led as voluntary restraint moved to more compulsory forms of restraint to political resentment, particularly after the Stirling crisis of late 1967. So there were contingent factors which undermined all of the attempts at modernising devices and technocratic uh, schemes that Wilson introduced or reprised from previous governments. These difficulties were not all immediately apparent. Indeed, Labour in the spring of 1966 comfortably won a 100 seat majority in the general election that they called having won the whole by-election. Thereafter, things got worse for them, particularly in the summer of 1966. First, there was the Siemens strike, which broke out in May, calling for increased pay, breaking the uh, pay norm that the government was trying to impose and reduced hours. After that was settled on the 1st of July, the government then ran into the balance of payments crisis, uh, which has become known as the July. July 1966 may have ended with England winning the World Cup at Wembley on the 30th of July, 10 days earlier Harold Wilson in the House of Commons was forced to announce emergency measures in face of the balance of payments crisis resulting from the Siemens strike, um, various uh, decisions by the American administration, which had impacted upon uh, the global economy and uh, the resulting run on sterling. In his statement, he mentions, I will begin with the measures needed to restrain private demand at home. The economy is carrying too heavy a burden of production financed by higher purchase. That means that too high a pro proportion of today's production is being paid for by a mortgage on tomorrow's earnings. Accordingly, there was a tightening up on consumption as well as on wages. As the leader of the opposition, another technocrat called Ted Heath, put it, vote Labour and pay later. The crisis also led to innovation in the field of fiscal policy. The Wilson government had already followed the tentative steps made by the Macmillan administration in the direction of capital gains tax and the introduction of corporation tax. In 1966, they followed this up with selective employment tax, effectively trying to use tax policy to shift production towards exports. Exactly the kind of problem which was uh, driving the kind of crisis Britain was facing. The Land Commission launched with a white paper in September 1965 was similarly intended to switch productive activities towards manufacturing um, rather than speculation and in, in land and the high development profits that could sometimes accrue to uh, individuals. But watered down as it became to a purely advisory body, it did not succeed in producing a switching of British productivity towards export-led manufacturing as intended by the government. The last prong of these attempts to break out of the um, limitations that the July days made clear was the European probe that Wilson launched. 
to explore the possibility of reopening a bid to join Europe, which had been closed by General de Gaulle of France in 1963. Wilson was not a natural Europeanist, and some of his economic advisers, such as Tommy Bala, had warned in the period in opposition that the shock of competition with retooled European industry could be such that the British patient may not survive. However, by the mid 1960s, the need to reposition British industry and increase the, its access to the growing markets of continental Europe had led Wilson to reappraise this position. A probe was launched. One of the innovative ideas that Wilson linked to it was his suggestion of a European technological community very much in keeping with his domestic uh, ambitions and a second bid eventually followed, though it was like the first bid in 1967 subject to de Gaulle's veto. Wilson however left the bid on the table from where it was picked up successfully by Ted Heath when he succeeded him as Prime Minister after 1970. If 1966 proved a problematic year, 1967 was even more challenging. The uh, Americans may have been sympathetic to supporting the British retaining an east of Suez um, position with penny packets scattered across the world, a point that Wilson had made in his first major speech in America as leader of the opposition in 1963. However, the sustainability of the costs of all these troops, particularly in West Germany, uh, in face of these recurrent um, balance of payments crisis became increasingly questionable. Successive defence reviews under Dennis Healy depicted here as Britannia, uh, particularly in 1966 to 1968, led to a reappraisal and eventually a decision to withdraw from east of Suez by 1971. By then, as George Thompson, the um, Commonwealth Secretary in 67 to 68, put it, the uh, later the attempt to retain British influence globally through leadership of the Commonwealth had proved a quote deeply um, uh, dis uh, disillusioning experience. Wilson had waxed lyrical about the um, importance of the Commonwealth in the run-up to the 64 election, but Commonwealth trade was of diminishing importance. One factor where it was nevertheless still a consideration was in thinking about sterling, because Commonwealth countries were tied to the sterling dollar rate. This was one of the considerations which prevented the Labour government uh, considering the uh, devaluation of sterling earlier than late 1967, aided by occasional packages of aid from the US. Then in 1967, you get the Six Day War. That conflict in the Middle East in June 1967 between Israel and its neighbours did not lead immediately to uh, pressure upon Sterling, but it gathered as the year went on, as did the government's other 
um, political problems such as the defeat by the SNP in the Hamilton by-election at the start of November 1967. Later that month, the uh, government was forced to devalue the pound um, and that effectively destroyed the sterling area and the linkage between the pound and a whole series of Commonwealth um, currencies. It also impacted very heavily upon the Labour government's rating in the opinion polls, notwithstanding Wilson's assurance that the pound in your pocket will not be affected. And the uh, final insult was the bloodbath that Labour suffered in the local government elections the following year in 1968. This perception that, as Wilson had put it, uh, Britain was mortgaging its future and paying itself beyond its means um, was uh, particularly expressed within the context of pay policy and the way in which wage push inflation was felt to impact upon the productivity or lack of product productivity in British industry. A Royal Commission under Lord Donovan was set up in 1965 to look at this particular issue and its report in 1968 uh, came in the same year that a strike by uh, machinists at the Ford plant in Dagenham drew attention to one very particular form of wage issue, that is the inequalities of pay experienced by women in large parts of British industry, um, which led in train to Barbara Castle introducing the Equal Pay Act of 1970. <clears throat> in the interim, Barbara Castle also looked at how to tackle these problems of workplace industrial strife, not least in her white paper in place of strife in 1969. She was in charge of prices, labour and productivity and saw resolving these kinds of issues through, for instance, introducing um, pre-strike ballots as a means of managing these kinds of pressures. Indeed, if the government was not able to deal with what increasingly looked like overmighty subjects amongst the trade union barons, famous line of uh, Harold Wilson to the head of the Amalgamated Union of Engineering Workers, Hugh Scanlon, get your tanks off my lawn, Huey, being a case in point, uh, led to perceptions of governmental overload and ungovernability, which were to bedevil Britain in the 1970s. The reform agenda of the government focused upon the economy but that wasn't the only issue that Wilson gave attention to. Some of this was forced upon him by the rise of nationalist challenges in Wales and Scotland, the start of the troubles in uh, Northern Ireland, um, and the willingness of the Conservatives to try and steal a march over Labour by bidding to be more in favour of devolution in Scotland than their opponents were in his Declaration of Perth in 1968. All of these pressures led Wilson in the end to uh, set up the Kilbrandon Commission into the Constitution, looking at the re relationships between the various territorial elements of the United Kingdom. Kilbrandon didn't in the end lead to very much. It was in the more technocratic administrative areas of policy reflecting Wilson's own 
particular interests and aptitudes that perhaps more success was garnered. First off, we might mention the Fulton Commission set up in 1966 to look at reform of the civil service. The first such report to be commissioned for over a hundred years, culminating in a list of 158 recommendations, looking at one of those elements of the establishment which had come under so much criticism at the start of the decade. Among the results of this was a civil service college, the civil service department, and eventually the hiving off of certain public services into what were called under the Thatcher government executive agencies. Though the first of these, the post office, um, was effected at the end of Wilson's period in power. Another way in which he attempted to improve uh, administration was by the importation of the idea of the Ombudsman, the Parliamentary Commissioner for Administration from Sweden in 1969, charged with reviewing the uh, effectiveness and quality of um, administrative procedures in British government. Other areas of um, change, however, um, proved more frustrating. Reform of the House of Lords uh, was defeated by an unholy alliance between the Tory right and the Labour left um, for very different reasons. Um, electoral reform was not something that the government was necessarily hugely keen on, but they did at least really reduced the voting age to 18 in 1969. In retrospect, possibly the most innovative or important of the uh, modernising measures carried out by Wilson's first government came from the later period of uh, office from 67 onwards, but were not primarily associated with him. You have the um, gradual abolition, effective abolition of the death penalty for murder. You have the Abortion Act of 1967, um, which legalises abortion um, of a pregnancy. Uh, you have the Sexual Offences Act 1967, which legalised uh, homosexual acts between gay men in private if they were over the age of 21. And you had the liberalisation of the divorce laws in 1969. These were all measures uh, which have been more associated with Roy Jenkins, the man pictured here, although by the time most of them were passed, he had already moved from the Home Office to the Treasury. Furthermore, most of these pieces of legislation were uh, originating as private members bills, though it was of course the government who allowed them time to pass. The extent to which this was an innovation can be debated, as Mark Jarvis has shown in the book pictured here. Um, quite a few of these processes of liberalisation had already originated under the Tories and particularly Rob Butler's spell at the Home Office in 1957 to 62. Nonetheless, in terms of how people see this government, these were among the most important modernising measures. This liberalism only went so far, as was exemplified by the crackdown on private radio stations in 1967, 
It was not until 1973 under Ted Heath's government that commercial radio was allowed to take off in Britain. There was more success in modernisation in the field of education. A particular example was the creation of the Open University in 1969. Wilson believed that this would help to build a more competitive economy and also promote greater equality of opportunity and social mobility using the new technological opportunities that television and radio brought. Is that very much of a piece with Wilson's modernization schemes. The advancement of egalitarian access to education was also taken forward by Tony Crossland's Circular 1065 um, as Education Secretary in 1965, which authorised local authorities to plan to convert schools to comprehensives, a process which, um, on which the uh, party had been balked in the late 1940s, but was to be taken forward very rapidly in the late 60s and 1970s. Some aspects of the drive for egalitarianism could, however, be seen as problematic. From the late 1950s onwards, it had become increasingly apparent in academic research that the rise of the welfare state had not dealt with continuing pockets of poverty and deprivation, something that uh, the investigations of Peter Townsend and Brian Abel Smith in the mid 1960s drew attention to leading to the founding of the Child Poverty Action Group and their concern that in the run up to the 1970 election that the poor were getting poorer under Labour. The creation of new towns as well had moved people out from inner city Britain in the late 1940s, but by the late 1960s, there was an increasing, increasing awareness that this had led uh, declining um, inner city um, sinks of deprivation, uh, which needed new attention directed to them. Something to which the Wilson government attempted to respond before their unexpected defeat in the general election of the summer of 1970. Back in opposition, Wilson was not the dynamic force he had been as leader of the opposition in 1963 to 64. He wrote a massive slab of a memoir that labelled government a personal record. He was lampooned by the BBC uh, television programme Yesterday's Men and uh, to some extent he retained an Olympian detachment from the battles within his party which increasingly consumed his troops over a number of issues. One of these uh, in particular was Europe, um, where uh, it was people like Roy Jenkins who took the lead on defending the European position and indeed helping the Tories to pass the legislation against the opposition of their own right wingers. It was um, left to elements on the left to take the lead in the development of Labour's um, policy making during opposition culminating in the uh, Labour's economic uh, programme 1973 um, and the kinds of ideas which got bundled together with the Labour label the alternative economic strategy partly driven by the perception of those modernisers on the left in the previous government that 
the government in the end had been unduly disinclined to listen to the grassroots of the party and had been too concerned with managing the crisis rather than coming up with radical solutions to it. In contrast to Heath's idea of anchoring Britain to Europe whilst continuing um, on the attempts to modernise prices and incomes that marked the Labour government's struggles, or the ideas in the Liberals of a modernisation around um, imitating and importing the mechanisms and constitutional structures of West Germany. The left went off in favour of a um, policy of high tariff walls and uh, this was designed to enable a uh, defence of British living standards against what was seen as the cold winds blowing from the economy in the rest of the world, particularly in light of the uh, energy crises of the early 1970s, such as the oil price hike of 1973, around the time of yes, another war in the Middle East. It was against this backdrop that the first national coal strike took place in 1972. A large part of the driver for this was the pay differentials we talked about earlier. Miners' real pay compared to their peers in other industries had fallen uh, considerably since the night start of the 1960s. And so the strike was in part about re-establishing the miners' position within the working class pecking order. It was a strike which culminated in victory for the miners um, in February 1972. Um, and this image of industrial uh, chaos and, and, and strife was uh, the opportunity for Labour to come up with another device for papering over these particular cracks, the notion of the social contract. Instead of the Conservatives Industrial Relations Act 1971 and the uh, way in which that had tried to impose a legal framework for the handling of industrial disputes. Labour promised a uh, agreement on prices and a social wage to the trade unions with the National Enterprise Board um, to di direct the kinds of modernisation Wilson had attempted in the 1960s uh, and compulsory planning group agreements with private industry so as to return to these kinds of ideas of driving um, efficiency and productivity forward. This in the 1974 general election held against the backdrop of a second minor strike for sufficient people in the country was enough for Labour to limp home as a minority government having won fewer votes than the Tories in the general election of February 1974. The minor strike was settled uh, at some expense and in October that year Labour were able to win a second general election with a narrow majority. Wilson's brief second term of 1974 to 76 nonetheless faced a host of other challenges. There were anxieties about comparability, um, 
which in the end led to the uh, creation of a royal commission in, uh, under uh, Wilson's successor to look at comparability claims. There were um, problems in Northern Ireland after his abolition of Stormont, the Northern Ireland Parliament, and attempt to create a power sharing executive between the various parties in Northern Ireland, um, which founded on the Ulster Workers' Strike in the summer of 1974. There were divisions in the cabinet, not least around the somewhat divisive left wing figure of Tony Benn, first at the um, Department for Industry and then as Energy Secretary in charge of uh, an important department as North Sea Oil came on stream after 1975. Not least, these divisions were over uh, the continuing uh, fights over Europe. Wilson had papered over the cracks in his party and the country on this issue in 1974 by promising that there would be a renegotiation of Britain's terms of entry. Um, when Britain had joined on the 1st of January 1973. This culminated in a somewhat cosmetic exercise, um, which was then ratified in the 1975 referendum by a two thirds majority. Wilson, in that particular instance, uh, was astute enough to avoid himself getting drawn into the debate. He left the argument up instead to a highly effective cross-party coalition of business and um, political leaders, whilst the, their opponents were a ragtag uh, assemblage of various seeming mavericks and misfits who, uh, whose inability to agree amongst themselves um, undermined their ability to make a coherent case against the modernity that entry to Europe at the time promised. So in that sense, Wilson ended his period in with a successful exercise in modernizing at least Britain's relations with the rest of the world. Modernizing the economy proved more challenging, um, not least as the phenomenon known as stagflation, rising unemployment alongside rising inflation became one of the characteristics of the 1970s, particularly as inflation really took up to around 20% in the mid 1970s. So how can we conclude this review of Wilson as a modernizer? In origin, he was a successful and for some time, a charismatic leader who was arguably blown off, blown off course by what his uh, predecessor, but one Harold Macmillan, had called events, dear boy, events. We also mustn't exaggerate the extent to which the um, problems that confronted Wilson were themselves tractable. There was plenty of structural problems within the British economy which militated against the kind of modernization Wilson sought, both internationally and nationally. His, he proved successful at repeatedly papering over the cracks, uniting his party around particular solutions. And in the end, he was a remarkably successful leader of Labour. The only man, uh, apart from William Gladstone, to have won four elections. Ultimately, 
Wilson was a pragmatist whose governments left important legacies, particularly in those areas of social and cultural policy that Wilson himself didn't focus on. In the more technocratic and economic areas for which he was arguably more prepared and on which he uh, focused more, uh, the record is more mixed. He does come across as someone who was attempting to drive forward a more socially democratic and indeed more socially just uh, country and economy, um, though some of his interventions, such as the selective employment tax, arguably didn't necessarily uh, always uh, support such solutions. Fiscal policy under Wilson was broadly, if mildly, progressive in this field. What he didn't succeed in doing was creating a social democratic consensus. Indeed, the extent to which Labour in the period 1964 to 76 established some kind of hegemony, if not quite uh, established itself as the natural party of government was to prove to be a problem, particularly when a new leader on the left arose who was to loudly proclaim a different kind of narrative of what might be the solutions facing Britain. But that's the story for next week.